Hello, I'm Reagan Wascom, Chair of the Water Center at Colorado State University. Welcome again to our online course on water, civilization, and nature, addressing 21st century water challenges. Now, before we get started, a few pieces of course business. Naturally, you're free to select from the offerings in this course, the lectures, and the online features that are of particular interest to you. We do, however, have a suggested sequence for the topics and lectures, which presents the topics in a logical order, building somewhat on each other. The sequence is reflected in the transitional comments that you'll hear me making as we go through the course. Water is frequently thought of in terms of its cycle, from evaporation to clouds to rain and back to earth, where precipitation may evaporate again, linger in the snowpack, run off into rivers, get stored in lakes or infiltrate into aquifers. If you're already familiar with the various parts of the hydrologic cycle, you may want to stay with me for this introductory lecture. If you'd like a brief introductory refresher on the various pathways and storage compartments represented in the hydrologic cycle, you might enjoy visiting the pages in the introductory module on the water cycle. From the distance of outer space, the planet we live on appears as a beautiful blue circle. We call it planet Earth, but it could easily be called planet water. 71% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. From space, it would be hard to imagine that this planet has water scarcity problems. On our planet, water exists in liquid, vapor, and solid forms, moderating the climate and creating the media for life. Indeed, life teems and evolves in fresh and salt water on planet Earth. Water effectively mediates all biological processes. Without water, proteins don't work and life as we know it would not exist. As humans, we're defined by water. 65% of the human body is water. The relationship between humans and water determines where we live, how we live, and what we do. Society has always positioned itself in proximity to water to meet our basic needs for transportation, for protection, commerce, and food. It's interesting to contemplate how central a role water has played in the belief systems throughout human history. The human spirit somehow understands water as the great beginning. Kate Johnson notes in her book, Earth, Water, Fire, and Air, that the Hopi creation myth starts with, in the beginning the earth was nothing but water. Water is not only an aspect of indigenous spirituality, but a major component of that spirit world. Water, whether as a substance or in the form of lakes, rivers, and meteorological phenomena, such as rain, snow, fog, and clouds, are seen through a spiritual, not an economic lens. Contrast that view to the Western view of water as an economic good that can be owned or used as a vehicle to transport waste away from our settlements. The Maori tribesmen of New Zealand were confounded by the European view of water as something that could be owned or used to transport sewage effluents. Yet our modern society does this every day without question. The ancient works of previous civilization reflect that reverence for water. The sound of water, the feel of water, the look of water. It sustains, it cleanses, it's the essential element for growth and renewal. Water has inspired us to poetry, music, and art as well. While D. H. Lawrence pondered the miracle of water, as scientists we know that the molecular properties of the hydrogen bond network of water is the key to understanding water. The water molecule is polar, it's sticky, water molecules cling together. Water stays liquid through a very wide temperature array, allowing life on Earth as we know it. It absorbs heat, allowing living things to regulate their temperatures. The solid phase is less dense than the liquid phase. Water is a great solvent. It facilitates the biochemical reactions of life. And water molecules are tiny. One human red blood cell can hold three trillion water molecules. And although we live on this watery planet, the irony is that most of the water on the planet is not easily available for our use. Still, the amount of available fresh water is a tremendous resource. And you notice the small dot reflecting the relative volume of fresh water on planet Earth. Water is not static like other natural resources such as coal or other fossil fuels. Water is in motion, driven around the globe by solar energy, 
it captures and moves solar energy and the result is the purification, renewal, variability and the extremes that we see in water. The world pattern of precipitation shows strong disparities between large annual rainfall in the tropics where some areas get in excess of 10 meters of precipitation annually and the semi-arid and arid regions such as the Sahara Desert that receive almost nothing at all. It's hard to live in either extreme but humans manage to do so. Globally there are a number of serious challenges facing us in the 21st century regarding water that will define how we live. These challenges include sanitation and access to clean water, water for development, food security, weather extremes, ecosystem services, water for energy, water quality. We'll dig deeper into each of these during the course. One major change factor is that since 1947, since World War II, 47, since World War II, consumptive water use worldwide has increased more than 400 percent. And you can see this in this chart that shows both population and water withdrawals over time over the last century. There's a direct correlation between global population growth and the increase in freshwater consumption. Now we're talking about these challenges as global problems and that is because the problems span the globe but in reality all water problems are local. There's really no global water crisis. There's thousands of local water problems around the globe. The Falcon Mark Water Scarcity Index assumes that the absolute minimum of 100 liters per person per day is needed each day for hygiene and cooking. A minimum of 1,000 cubic meters per capita per year is the level where water the economy and human well-being. And you can see on the chart the red areas indicating where the Falcon Mark Water Scarcity Index assumes that there's a problem. Now humans are also heavily dependent on rivers, oceans, and estuaries for a great deal of our total protein intake as well. This slide shows water stress regions and please note that the majority of the 24 mega cities, that is those cities with greater than 10 million people, are found along the coast within regions experiencing mild to severe water stress. This is particularly true for the cities located on the Asian continent. Water stress is a measure of the amount of pressure put on water resources and aquatic ecosystems by the users of these resources, including the municipalities, industries, power plants, and ag users that line the world's rivers. Also please note that there are 263 international shared river basins worldwide. The global overview of water availability versus population stresses the continental disparities and in particular the pressure put on the Asian continent which supports more than half the world's population but only has about a third of the world's water resources. Compare that to North America, South America and Europe if you will. In the US and other industrialized nations most of our water withdrawals are for energy, agriculture and public water supply. Clean water is fundamental to human health. According to the United Nations, the human right to water is a prerequisite to the realization of all other human rights. So this brings up the question as to whether water is a property right or a human right. And in the U.S., I think you'd have to argue that it's both. It's been estimated that women in developing countries spend an average of six hours per day collecting and purifying water. This situation increases the income and economic disparities as well as educational disparities educational disparities experienced by women and girls. Most of these live in Asia and Africa. There's also the issue of what qualifies as adequate sanitation and safe water. Safe clean water costs money and the poor may pay a disproportionate fraction of their incomes for the service. It's interesting that the same people who lack water also tend to lack adequate food, sanitation, health care, and are most likely to be affected by natural disasters. This is the so-called multiple burdens of water poverty. Nearly 2 million children die each year from waterborne disease. 60 million children are stunted due to waterborne diarrheal diseases. 
Over two billion humans lack access to sanitation facilities, exacerbating the problems of waterborne disease. We know how to engineer fixes to these problems. Getting it accomplished in a manner that's self-sustaining is the challenge. Now switching to agriculture, irrigated ag consumes huge amounts of the water used by humans, about 70% of the total used. Global food production doubled in the second half of the 20th century, and currently 18% of the world's 1.5 billion hectares of cropland are irrigated, but four comes from this irrigated land. Irrigation tends to be concentrated in the arid and semi-arid regions where it represents a significant share of cropland, as well as in the humid tropics of Southeast Asia, where irrigation has made possible to move from one or two to two or even three harvests of rice per year. Much of that irrigation occurs on small farms. In India and China, which are the number one and two irrigated nations in the world, followed by the United States, with about 56 million irrigated acres. So water for food is a global challenge. We're expecting a 40% increase in population by 2050, doubling the demand for food. And as societies develop, they demand more animal protein, which requires more grain and hence more water. So the bottom line is we must grow more food with less water in the 21st century. Now U.S. farmers today use less water than they did just 30 years ago, yet produce 70% more food. We're on our way, but we still have a long way to go. Now another major topic that we'll cover in this course is climate and extreme hydrologic events. Drought is the biggest of these, but clearly typhoons and hurricanes and flooding causes much human misery. This figure shows the increase in major natural catastrophes since 1950s, and what you see that with that increase, it reflects the increase in human population. The Earth has always used extreme events in water, often in the form of tsunamis, floods, droughts, to do its business of moving mountains, rivers, and species about. Extreme events become catastrophes when human civilization gets in the way. The results are often disastrous. Hurricane Sandy on the U.S. East Coast and Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans showed the vulnerabilities of our coastal cities to extreme events. So how has the Western world adapted to hydrologic uncertainty, floods, and drought? Through harnessing the power of water. Now, mankind has been using water as a source of power for centuries, if not millennia, in the Imperial Rome, water-powered mules produced flour for grain and were used to saw timber and stones over a thousand years ago. More people, more development means more water engineering on the planet and altering the flow of rivers for irrigation and energy and the like it has both benefits and concerns that we need to think about. This chart shows the history of global de development going back to the 1700s and what you see is how quickly in the 20th century dams propagated across the planet. In the US the era of large dam building is nearly over but globally dams are being built to control floods, to store and redistribute water as well as to generate much needed electricity to power growth. Unfortunately, one of the outcomes of these massive projects is the displacement of human settlements, but there are environmental considerations as well. When water systems were designed in the 20th century, the question was, how much water can we reliably withdraw from the river? Today's question is, how much water do we need to leave in the river for those living things? Clearly, species that depend on aquatic ecosystems to sustain them evolve to require certain hydrologic conditions, both in terms of high flow, low flows, temperature, and others. Now, a final topic that we'll cover in the course is that of water quality. Water must be of suitable quality to meet its intended use. Water quality constraints, it's used just as surely as having adequate flows does. Globally, the number one challenge is insufficient access to potable water for uh, drinking as well as civilization. 
in the industrialized world, municipal and industrial wastewater, urban and ag runoff of poor quality are the number one issue. And much of the problem that results is due to sedimentation, but also to the movement of nutrients. And this issue of global nitrogen pollution and the changes that that causes to the environment is a significant problem of the 21st century that we'll have to deal with. Not only does it cause problems in freshwater ecosystems, but clearly our oceans and estuaries, our bays, uh, suffer from uh, hypoxia and these oxygen depleted zones where nutrients are too high. And if you know where those zones are, especially where they happen persistently, they tend to be around uh, major cities and industrial areas. So why the sense of urgency to address these water challenges? Clearly, the world population is growing most rapidly in water short regions. Water demand is increasing. The potential for conflict between water users is increasing. Climate and multiple severe droughts since the 1990s have had significant impacts and raised concerns about our increasing vulnerability as a society. Water supplies are fully or over-appropriated in many river basins around the world, as well as many of the major aquifers. Most levels of government are poorly prepared for water disasters, for drought, for the increasing water needs due to population growth and climate variability. And then finally, existing water laws and institutions are not able to accommodate all of the needs. Yes, and then there's the issue of climate change and its impact on water resources. So how can you make a difference? Education and awareness is important, personal action, and support for better governance at all scales. Additionally, you can certainly investigate you and your family's water footprint. Find out how your use of energy, the way you eat, and the things you consume impacts water resources. There's big challenges ahead in water resources management. Education, local action, innovation, technology, better governance and management at all levels will be required to meet these challenges. We're glad you're taking time to learn more about water resources through this open online course. Now regarding the course from here, naturally you're free to select from the offerings of the course the features that are of interest to you in the sequence that's of interest to you. We do however have a suggested sequence for the topics and lectures which presents them in a logical order building somewhat on each other. When you finish watching the lecture for each module, there are additional activities and reading for each area. If you're interested in earning a statement of accomplishment for the course, you should visit the discussion forum for each module, post your comments, and respond to at least one other student's comments. You should also take the quiz for each module. There's eight questions per quiz, and you will need to answer six correctly to pass the quiz. In addition, there's a number of optional links for interactive exercises, readings, and CSU resources. Thanks for joining us on this exploration of water.